objection. The Honourable Peter Dunn. Mr Speaker, there was an awesome dignity about Sir Paul that struck one the first time one met him, and at times could be taken to perhaps, perhaps belie the force of personality and the force of conviction that uh, came with Sir Paul. But in many senses he was the perfect choice to be the Governor-General in, in New Zealand during the 1980s, because at a time when this country had gone through periods of great division and tension, he showed that it was possible to hold strong views, to promote strong views, not only forcefully and courageously, but with a dignity and an honour that would garner respect even from his most bitter opponents. And so it proved to be during the time that he was Governor-General of New Zealand. He spoke out fearlessly on many issues. He provided the leadership he had spoken of, courage with dignity. And he brought New Zealanders with him to become one of our more revered figures in that role. But, Mr Speaker, there was another side to Sir Paul. There was a fearsome sense of humour, an extraordinary laugh that would break out when a joke was cracked or some funny situation had occurred, which showed that this man not only possessed dignity, not only possessed a very serious side, but had a very warm and personal side as well. And I want to recall to the House, sir, a particular incident that I was privileged to be part of, which I think demonstrates all of these things. Members will be familiar with ceremonies where ambassadors come to present their credentials. One such ceremony occurred with three ambassadors from countries not connected to each other. The only common link between all three was a minimal knowledge of English. We worked our way through the official ceremony and then the luncheon to follow. And Sir Paul was at his best, trying to make small talk with people who understood very little other than that they were in Wellington, New Zealand. He tried every known tack imaginable with dignity and courtesy and got solid smiles of rebuff from across the table. And finally, at about dessert, he said to them, my next appointment is to go to a bird sanctuary, which meant absolutely nothing to the audience, to name two new Kiwis. The word Kiwi triggered a reaction in the three diplomatic officials. It was the one word of English that they knew, and they sparked to light and said, ah, Kiwi, Kiwi. And Sir Paul then turned to the New Zealanders present and said, yes, I'm going to name them after two famous New Zealanders. Well, the, the signs of blankness reappeared on the audience, and he said, I'm going to call one Kiwi T Kanawa and the other Kiwi T James, which got a, a huge reaction from the New Zealanders, but obviously had not really registered on the faces of his audience. And it summed up for me what Sir Paul was, this man who had carried out his solemn office with dignity and responsibility, he had shown extraordinary courtesy and tolerance to people who were really struggling on the occasion, but at the same time there was a massive sense of humour that he couldn't resist employing and having a good laugh at the end of it. And Mr Speaker, when we think about Sir Paul's contribution to our national life over the last several decades, because it really has been a very long contribution. We have to recall with pride the, the vision, the leadership, the integrity, the commitment, but also the fact that he remained throughout it essentially himself. He never took on airs and graces. He never succumbed to that great Kiwi disease of being up himself. He was a simple man who was confident in his views, confident in his abilities and sought to do his best for his fellow New Zealanders. We have truly lost one of our greatest citizens. And, sir, I extend my sympathy to Lady Reeves and the family on their loss and hope that they can derive some small consolation at this time from the knowledge that their husband and father was held in near universal regard across this country. And that, sir, is the ultimate tribute New Zealanders can pay to him. Uh, 